welcome back to the Shatterproof Speaker Series. Were you able to join us on Saturday for the Stronger Than Addiction virtual celebration event? If not, click on the home page of this site to view it. There was a special performance by Melissa Etheridge that was amazing. I'm really excited about today's speaker series because I have these two wonderful ladies joining me. You may have heard of Lemonada Media's podcast, Last Day. If you haven't, I highly recommend you listen wherever you get your podcast from because these two break down addiction in a way that is digestible and will leave you feeling all the things, happy, sad, devastated, hopeful, inspired, and most of all, on a quest for progress. Joining us today is Stephanie Whittles-Wax, co-founder and chief creative officer, as well as co-founder and CEO, Jessica Cordova-Kramer. Welcome, ladies. Hello. Thanks. Hey. We're so excited How to be here. Doing? Um, so take us back, ladies. How did you guys meet? Oh, man. Steph, should I start? Absolutely. Um, Go for it. <clears throat> so traditional old school podcast romance. Um, except it's a sisterly romance that has no romance whatsoever. We haven't seen each other in months. Um, no, I mean, the, it's, it, it's a, it's a sad story. And then I, I think every, I think, I think the universe every day for introducing me to Stephanie through what is like the worst thing that ever happened to me. My brother, Stefano Cordova Jr. passed away just about three years ago from an accidental overdose. Um, and in the depths of my grief, I listened to Stephanie on a podcast, um, the greatest podcast of all time. If you are going through anything hard, which you are terrible. Thanks for asking, um, with Nora McInerney. And I saved an episode, um, about what looked like a, a sister who was going to talk about her brother who died of a heroin overdose. So I saved it for my birthday because that's what you do. Um, when you're miserable is you save extra miserable things for birthdays. Um, and it was, I, it was like, just, I just felt like less alone. I felt less like this horrible thing had happened to just me. Um, and Stephanie was talking about her incredible brother, Harris, who had died several years before, two years before. Um, and, uh, he sounded so much like Stefano Harris was a comedian, but he just magnanimous kid died way too soon. Total epic shit show of a life afterwards and also before frankly as many folks listening to this know um and then i made her talk to me and then i made her do a podcast about the opioid crisis and i love she that she wakes up she wakes up every me. she wakes up every morning <laughs> ruining the day um but what's your version whittles it's pretty much right it's pretty much it every morning i wake up god why did this woman email me 18 months ago um, no, it was like, I, you know, you have these cosmic connections with people that you don't really have a choice, but to yeah. be in their, in their, in their sphere, in their galaxy. Um, that's what happened with Jess. You know, she, she reached out. I was a week away from giving birth. I was very large. I stand at a very tall five feet. And when I'm pregnant, it's scary. Um, how, just how large I get. Um, and I was like, I am very uncomfortable right now. And I like loved talking to her and Jess can tell you, like, I don't want to talk on the phone. I'm, you know, but we, we connected so deeply and I didn't want to get off the phone. Um, and at the very end, she did this thing that I now know that she does where she has this master plan in her head that she just sort of like breadcrumbs out for you. <laughs> and she breadcrumbed out for me. I have this idea of doing a podcast about the opioids crisis. Do you want to do it? I mean, it was literally like, okay, bye. Great to meet you. Hey, I have this idea. And I was like, mm, I don't know. I'm going to give birth and then we'll circle back, you know? And I really didn't plan on it because I had written a book and I had, I was further along in my grief. Like, like she said, my brother died in 2015. Stefano died in 2017. And I got to be honest with you. I was like done talking about opioids. I was done thinking about opioids. I didn't want that to be my life. I don't think anyone wants that to be their life. And um, my son was three or four months old. And I read this article that opioids are killing more people now than car accidents. And I literally picked up the phone, emailed Jess and said, all right, let's do your podcast. <laughs> let's do this. Um, and that was the beginning of that journey for us. And we planned to do this one show we are now about to launch our 10th uh, in a year. Um, so I don't know, like two grief-stricken type A sisters 
are uh, like uh, truly made of, of fuel, of rocket fuel. Like I, I feel like Jess and I have very similar DNA in that way where we, um, we are doers and we have <laughs> taken that grief and done. We have done a lot. Yeah, um, it sounds like the universe has brought the two of you together to for for both of you to help um, dig each other out of that black hole of grief, right? Um, so why why this medium as opposed to others? The podcast medium, I mean. Yeah, I mean I can take a stab and then Go you know it. yeah, it's just such an intimate medium. It's like you know when we started. Um, someone said, you know, I listen to podcasts and, and I want to make you my best friend. I think that's the nature of podcasts is that the host becomes somebody who's literally in your ears and your brain and who feels like they're talking directly to you. There's no, there's no breakdown of audience and performer. Like you are, you are together. And um, this story in particular, when you're talking about loss and grief and things that are very personal, which is what we talk about Eliminata, um, also, we make a lot of jokes. Uh, it works better in that kind of intimate medium, I found. So it's the, it's the perfect place for it, frankly. Yeah. Yeah, I think podcasts are incredibly intimate. I think with Last Day in particular, we, I, I, I didn't mention this, but I was um, working with Crooked Media. I produced Pod Save the People with Duray. So I had done podcasts before, big market podcasts before. So we had some, you know, wisdom on that front. Stephanie is a writer and a theater director and a voice actress. So all of those things just made podcasting make a lot of sense. And from a business perspective, it, the cost of entry to a podcast is not nearly what it is for TV or film. So we had this crazy concept where we wanted to zoom in on Stefano's last day of life in order for people to understand the real faces behind the opioids crisis, the real humanity behind the opioids crisis. Um, and so, um, the podcast just made a ton of sense for that. And now, as Stephanie said, Lemonada has, we're about to launch our 10th series um, and last day is coming back for season two. So, you know, podcasts stick and thankfully are somewhat pandemic proof. We've been able to keep it going. There are so many podcasts about the opioid crisis, yet this is one that has resonated so strongly with the community. Why that is? Because Stephanie's the queen of darkness and light. <laughs> <laughs> darkness and light. So uh, elaborate on that a little bit more. Yeah, elaborate on that, Jess. I will. <laughs> elaborate on I will. I am your big, I am her biggest fan. Um, I won't, you know, we've, we've talked about various configurations of the company where Stephanie's not in, like, overseeing our creative, cre everything that we do, even chat shows, and I'm, like, not having any of it. Um, I just think everything she touches uh, earlier, I said everything she gets her hands around the neck of just has this beautiful balance between the misery and joy of living. And when you lose your person, you are still making jokes. You're remembering them. Harris was an actual comedian. My brother was not a professional comedian, but, you know, he was hilarious. And so there's, you're listening to the show. Andy Slavitt, it's, I think it's his favorite podcast, said to us at one point, like, just when I think I can't take it anymore and I might need to turn it off. Stephanie makes like a heroin joke and I'm laughing um, and there's nothing funny about heroin, but like you have to see the light in order to make your way through this. Um, and I think there's just something about that. And the fact that um, the show does not just tell our story or Stefano's story or Harris's story, but zooms in on so many aspects of the crisis from first responders to doctors to this, that, and the other, not so much about blame, but like, how do we help people live with addiction? Um, so I think it was successful because Stephanie made it. Why do you think it was successful? You were just just stacking up those points. I, my heart is very full. I will remember this moment when I ruin when I'm ruining the day. Um, no, that's very kind. I I I do not take all of that credit. Um, we have amazing, like truly amazing producers and editors like we work with great people like we hired our last day team freelance and the second we could snatch them up full time we did um because they tell stories in a way that is just very beautiful and everyone has like ownership of the project and everyone cares so deeply about it and i think you hear that 
we're a very small team. Um, there was only, you know, between three to four. Uh, and so you hear these like very narrative shows and then you hear the credits and there's like 25 producers. That's not last day. We have three to four people on our credits. And so you're working very intimately with your team. Um, I think that people in this space want to hear first person stories. I think they don't want to hear, I don't know what people want to hear and not don't hear. My opinion is that like the talking head, I'm talking at you, I'm giving you the facts of this. We're very saturated with that. We're very saturated with facts and data and charts and graphs. So we're desensitized to it. And when it's your person, like I don't care about how many people die, it's my person died. Um, and to be able to speak about your experience in a way that's vulnerable and like Jess said, like the thing about grief is like you are cracking jokes at this very bizarre time when you shouldn't be and that's how we sort of survive. So to weave that element into it, I think has made people feel like, oh, you're telling my story. Like, yeah, you're you, but that's my story. And that's what we get a lot. Jess has personally responded to the thousands of emails that we've gotten. And I'm, that is not an exaggerated number. Like it makes me tear up actually just saying that because so many people have emailed us and like life stories, like the worst, most tragic things and she has personally responded to every single one of them. Um, and so like you, it's, it's like very emotional for us. Like we, we wanted to do the podcast so people would stop dying. That was an actual goal. We also wanted to create a community for people. And in fact, when we wrapped last day, season one, and we were done talking about opioids, Jess and I, I remember had a conversation where we were like, Hey, um, the community is not done talking about opioids. The community is not done talking about addiction. So we, we may be done telling this story, but they're not. So what do we do? Let's do a new show with Nzinga and let's dig into addiction and let's call it in recovery and let's like talk about it endlessly. <laughs> and so I think um, all of those reasons are why <laughs> the show works. Um, one other thing that in that vein is like we we were we ran ads really early on the radio in mm -hmm. places like Oklahoma and Boston and West Virginia places we knew were really hard hit and we had reports of people like pulling off on the side of the road people who had never listened to a podcast but trying to figure out how to find the podcast because they were like their kid was dealing with an opioids issue or they'd lost their person or they themselves were um, so I think there was like a word of mouthness to it where, where we, we knew we were filling a space because we had nothing. We couldn't, and you guys are too at Shatterproof, like Atlas and Aetna. If, if those resources had exist when Harris and Stefano were alive, we might have found the right recovery program for us, for them. If last day had existed when Harris and Stefano were alive, we might have pushed them harder on medically assisted treatment. We just didn't know. And so filling that void has been a real asset. Right. Well, as of, uh, I was going to say viewer, but listener of the show myself, I can tell you a few things come across. Um, addiction is something that is so um, pervasive and everybody deals with it in some way, whether they realize it or not, whether they're conscious of it or not. And even myself listening to the show, I've thought like some of the topics, I was listening to one earlier um, Dr. Gabor Mate, when he talks about trauma, how relative is that to everything in life, right? And it, it forces you to think about things in a way that, that you've never thought of them before. Um, so I think, I think a lot of people are able to relate to you guys and, and it does, it feels like Stephanie is your best friend. So a question I wanted to ask you guys is, as you listen to the series, it sounds like you've learned a lot of things along the way. What are the main things that you wish you knew when your brothers were with us that would have been the most helpful? You deal with this one, this fun, this fun question. I have my list. I mean, it is, it is incredible how much uh, I have learned. I can like cite it for you like this. So. Um, medication assisted treatment was like a, a breakthrough for me, right? Like, um, not the idea that exists. I know, I knew that it existed, but I did not understand that you could be on it for a very long time for maybe your entire life. Sure. And, and, and that speaks to like the disease framework of addiction. 
and me not really having the uh, the knowledge, the information, the expertise, the wisdom to know that this is a, a chronic medical illness. I didn't know that. I thought we would just put Harris in 30 day treatments and he should get better. And when he kept not getting better, because that model is not effective for most people, um, like being so frustrated with him instead of where I should have been putting my energy, right? Like this is a chronic medical illness. I would not do this if you had diabetes or cancer or something like that. And to reframe it in that way was also revolutionary. The idea that it is a five year recovery, 30 days is not enough. 30 days scratches the, like an, a millimeter of the surface. Um, that was revolutionary for us to figure out. Um, the most heartbreaking episode of the entire series, I will say it again and again, is when Jess um, had, her, had her breakdown and said that she just wishes that she would have been able to tell Stefano, don't use alone. Um, and so the, the, the whole idea of harm reduction and not using alone is part of that, right? I didn't know any of that. I didn't know about Narcan. I didn't know about, you know, if you're gonna use, make sure you use with a friend. Um, you know, just so many things along the way. Um, and then finally, when we, towards the end of the season, went to these, treatment facilities that are doing treatment so differently than the ineffective money-driven systems that we have set up, uh, frankly, you know, these, these in and out residential rehabs, going to Eleanor Health and seeing an outpatient model that was so robust and that addressed the biological, social, psychological, you know, all of the, the, the magic formula that Nzinga talks about, um, seeing that you could design a treatment program that is individualized, seeing that if somebody relapses, or as we say, like has a recurrence of their symptoms, that they are not a failure, they are exhibiting uh, their, their, their illness, right? They're exhibiting right. symptoms of an illness and we should absolutely welcome them back in. Um, going to the women's home in Houston and seeing an 18 month program where they match these women who have struggled with homelessness, mental health issues that have been undiagnosed largely their whole lives, sexual trauma, various, you know, abuse trauma, giving those women a place to go for free for 18 months, giving them jobs, giving them job training, helping them build their resumes, filling up their buckets in so many different ways, giving them 30 hours a week of, of therapy, um, addressing that trauma that Dr. Mate talked about. It just, Again, like Jess says, there's this 90% of us feel, like we, we feel, and I will speak for Jess too, mostly so thrilled that we have created this roadmap for people. We get mental, we get, we get students who email us all the time telling us that their professors are using this in their family and addiction classes, in their psychology classes, you know, in their master's programs. And we, we love that there's a little tinge that exists in both of us that goes, damn it, like our brothers didn't have to die. And, and that like sucks. And that's yeah. something that we, that we like doing the show. We're like, they, they, the, it, everything failed them. Everything failed them. And so if we can provide like that, here are the things that you need to do differently. Like I'm, I'm, I'm game for that to, to, like minimize the suffering of like so many people who are losing their lives to this unnecessarily. Nothing to add. <sighs> the end. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, what you talked a little bit about hearing from uh, listeners of the show and students and things like that. What has been like the general feedback you've heard about the show or is there any powerful stories that have happened as a result of it? Oh my god. Jess, go for it. <laughs> go for it. I'm not allowed to read the reviews. They're they're incredible, by the way. Uh, but every once in a while you get a person who's like, actually, we haven't gotten this since the very the very beginning of the show before it was clear that we were really telling every aspect of the story. Um, we got a like Stefano's last day, you hear Paige, his wife, talking about how the first responders weren't particularly kind to her. 
Um, and we got feedback very quickly that was like, hey, do you know how hard it is to be a first responder when you've responded to your eighth opioid overdose call that day? Um, and then the next episode was first responders talking about the trauma of working in a space where people aren't getting the help that they need and then they're the last person that has to deal with it. So um, any of the critical stuff started to go away quickly, but still we, Stephanie's generally not, and maybe you do now, but in the beginning wasn't allowed to read, read reviews. Um, no. I, I think they have been incredible. They have been, I mean, we're getting, they, they still come in. We get about 150 to 100,000 new listeners on the series every month, um, even though it's been out of um, production since the spring. Um, so lots of new people finding it through word of mouth and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, people will pour their heart out in the Apple reviews. They will like the, the one that was, the one that was, there were two that were most resonant Early on, someone wrote a scathing review about how the Whittles family shouldn't have coddled Harris so much, and then maybe he'd still be alive. Um, and then that listener came back two weeks later and was like, I am so sorry. I have now listened to six episodes of your podcast. I am an asshole. Um, I have completely changed how I'm thinking. I'm so sorry. Um, so that was exactly what the show was meant to do. It was exactly to erase the stigma and misunderstandings around opioid use disorder and the family surrounding it. Um, and then the other one, we weren't sure if people who are like currently struggling with addiction would ever want to listen to this show about our brothers who died, you know, like there's just, maybe that's not our audience, but it's the opposite. Like we, we have, there's reviews from people who are like, I've been a active and now in recovery heroin user for 20 years. My wife listens to your show and she hugged me for the first time. Like I was a human being in like decades and like, that's the kind of stuff you're like, shit. Okay, we did it. I love that. So powerful. Um, see, now that's, that's the stuff where, I, I mean, I know that for both of you, like I, I work with people on a daily basis that are grief stricken like this. And, and I always say like, your grief is your love for that person turned inside out. And in working in this, I am so inspired by the people that I see that are able to take a pain that is so vast and so far reaching and channel it into something positive. So in just the example you just gave, like this show does exactly that. Um, so I commend you both for that. That's, you guys are, I, I, I hope you really understand how big everything that you're doing is because it is just even I, I grew up as a child of a person in long term recovery. My mom was in a before I was born. I grew up at AA meetings and things like that. And um, I listening to this and like mind blown every day. Like I didn't think about it like that. So um, and I work in this space. This is my full-time job. So <laughs> yep, to the yep. average person out there, sometimes, you know, and I, I get a lot of feedback from people that's like, oh, don't stick a needle in your vein. You won't have that problem type of stuff. And it's just like, oh my, where do I begin with you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, and yeah. you guys are doing that if you, and, and it's, it's great. So the, the next question I wanted to ask you was, I saw that Lemonada's media, Lemonada Media's larger mission of humanity unfiltered was inspired by last day what made you realize you could apply this to other crises that americans face well yeah wow. yeah i mean it couldn't have come at a, at a better time i mean we when we started the company we had looked at all of this data and anecdotally that people are just kind of miserable, right? Like there are, the people are suffering with some big things and they're not always talking about those things. Um, and the idea of like first person storytelling and putting your mess out there, you know, the good and the bad. And Jess always says like, giving you a reason to roll out of bed in the morning. Like it's sometimes you're like laying there and you're just like, I don't want to put my feet on the floor. Maybe we can create a show that helps people want to put their feet on the floor. You know, like that's all you can do some days. Um, and and now, like with the state of the world being what it is, so many more people are in that place. Um, and so the idea of humanity unfiltered is just like our humanity is is all of it. It's like the I mean, I I, I wrote a book that's called Everything Is Horrible and Wonderful, and I do 
I do very much believe that. Um, every day feels like both of those to me very intensely. Yes. Yes. Um, and I just think that that resonates with a lot of people because that is the human condition. Uh, and we are all so much more deeply tuned in to the human condition right now. Um, I think it was a lot easier before COVID for people to schedule their way out of their pain and mm -hmm. discomfort and to pack the, the travel schedule and to pack the, the this and then that. You literally can't do that right now. So I think a lot of people's stuff is coming out um, in a way that is really messy and raw. And we're here for that. Like that is what we, um, that is what we believe is the state of being a person. And um, if we can all talk about that stuff openly, it'll be a little bit easier. Amen. So. And let's just stop and talk for a second about how we have a giant societal issue with processing negative emotions. No one will walk up to you and say like, oh, knock the smile off your face, right? But if you're sad, they'll say like, don't be sad or let's, let's find something to get you out of this mood when sometimes all you really need to do is just feel that feeling, right? And move past it. And I think that's a lot of where um, addictions are born are in uh, our inability as a society to process negative emotions and focus on the positive only. Um, I see this in, in so many regards. And I think when you, you can't have um, light without dark and vice versa. And if you expect to be happy all the time, I think that's completely unrealistic. And then, you know, no one wants to, no one wants to be sad ever, but it's, it's a part of life, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jess hears me talk about my toddler constantly, but I, I do think that the, these little people who have not built their their infrastructures yet are such good like evidence of that. Like, the kid's gonna feel how he feels, and he's gonna feel it all over everybody, whether we want him to or not. Um, now we're stuck at home all the time, so he's feeling it all over everybody all the time, um, and the happy stuff. Like he's feeling the the fun and the joy too. So it's like you can, I can see like raising little people, how we condition people out of that place and how raw it all is when you come into the world. Uh, you know, and I have to try really hard as a parent to not be like, stop crying, stop crying. Right. Like it's hard. Sometimes you just want to be like, stop crying, you know? Right. But like if we can sort of like, as they're little condition them, like you're feeling sad, reflect that back to them. You know, I understand that does feel sad. That makes me feel sad too. We're just going to sit with that and you go ahead and cry. You know, I feel like we'll, it will help. It'll help. We start them young. Feel your feelings. Right. And yeah. And then our show, pass, right? <laughs> it'll pass if you talk about it. So like our, our, when we were starting with last day, we were just going to do that one show. And then we were like, you know what? The world is like really hard in a million ways. So why not have a whole network around it? And the humanity unfiltered tagline is the idea that we we don't tell other people's stories, we help them tell their own. Um, but we're telling the diversity of the human experience. Our second show is a disability activist talking about what it's like to live in her body with people who are super well known about what it's like to live in their bodies. Um, and, and you know, we've got a, a, a bunch of other shows now that fall in a similar vein, totally different styles, but like, you know, you could really hear your life and your experience mirrored in a Lemonada podcast in a way that makes you feel like just less alone, less, th the exact feeling I felt when I heard Stephanie talk about Harris on Terrible Thanks for Asking, we're trying to make that happen for millions and millions of people every month right now, um, because it is really energizing to be like, yeah, my life is challenging in a few ways, but so is that person's and I know how to get through it and I'm cracking a smile. I love that. So you guys talked a little bit about COVID and how it has stopped the world from spinning and it's kind of forced us all to look at what's really there, right? So we see a giant spike in um, alcohol sales, uh, overdoses, things like that. How has COVID impacted either your the show or your work on the show? I mean, in some ways we were built for this. So Lemonada was tiny and scrappy when we first started. Um, you know, no full-time staff except for me and Stephanie. And then we slowly grew. Uh, I was living in Minneapolis. Stephanie was living in Houston. We were, were all remote. Our teams were remote. 
And when the pandemic all of a sudden became reality, I mean, we were traveling right up until when they said stop and then we stopped. Um, mm -hmm. We had a basically remote operation. Um, so there were some blessings related to that. We also, uh, you know, we were like, oh God, is everyone going to stop listening to podcasts? Nope. They just stopped listening to them at six o'clock in the morning on their commute, but they were listening to them even more once like the smoke cleared. Um, so on the show in particular, I, I mean, Stephanie can speak to that more, but as a network, uh, you know, it, we've grown exponentially. Um, and I think it's, and we have one big COVID show. We have the biggest COVID show in the bubble with Andy Slavitt, um, which is like a family friendly way to process what the heck is happening from like legal stuff to medical stuff to cultural stuff. Um, but also I just think people need solace more than ever. So we've just grown our team. Like we're, we're like 20 full-time staffers now, which is intense. That's amazing. After season one of last day ended, what have you done to further your commitment to the cause? Develop season two. Yeah. I mean, again, like in recovery was, was big for us. We, we did not slate originally um, a recovery show. We did not slate an addiction show, but we saw the need and we filled it. Um, so we are still very deeply committed to destigmatizing addiction, to helping people better understand addiction, to helping people understand what everyone seems to have taken away from that Gabor Mate episode that is the episode when people say they listen to the show, they talk about the most. Um, because trauma is so universal, but the idea that like anything can be an addiction, we all have our stuff. Um, and, and that's in Zynga's message, you know, that addiction is something that you continue to do that derives some kind of benefit for you, despite negative consequences, right? You're not doing your thing because it's making you feel bad. It's providing relief. It's providing calm. It's providing whatever it is, right? Um, a quick band-aid. So my own understanding of addiction is like light years from what it was. So we're continuing on that mission to educate people um, and to destigmatize, which is a lot of what your work is, obviously. Uh, and then in terms of season two, yeah, it, it, it showed us that this idea of tackling these epidemics that are hard to explain but continue to get worse uh, people want to hear that. Uh, we didn't know initially if people would want to hear that. Um, we thought it would be our smallest show, um, but we felt like it was a passion project that we needed to do. We needed to get it out of ourselves. And um, we were wrong about that. Uh, a lot of people want to hear the show. And that's been, you know, so, so, um, like it's boosted us. It's made us feel like, okay, what we're doing matters. And when it came time for season two, there was a lot of overlap in season one. Suicide would come up. Uh, and it was sort of this, um, I mean, Gary talked about it in his episode. Um, you know, it, it, it's another part of this, of um, these epidemics of like loneliness and isolation and hopelessness. You find a lot of people who have struggled with suicidal ideation also have addiction of some kind. Um, and so it seemed like a natural season two fit for us. Um, and I would say to your point about COVID, unfortunately, like those rates are also going up now. Um, these feelings of isolation and hopelessness are not getting better. If anything, they're getting much worse. Um, and we are really like grateful to have a platform now to talk about these things in a way that that does paint the picture of of what it is really like, but also is working towards solutions. That's like a very important part of what we do. We never want to produce something that's just, um, well, here's a really terrible, painful, depressing thing. Goodbye. We want to say, here's a really terrible, depressing thing. Here are some jokes. And here's how you can get better. Here's what you can do to make the world better. It's like very integral to our mission of what we do. Um, and it's an exciting time for season two because we, we have our outline. We, we have talked to so many people so far in pre-production. Um, the way that we're going to be talking about suicide, I think is going to be very different than what we've gotten before. Uh, 
and hopefully we can be a place of comfort and solace and progress on that front as well. Stephanie and I speak as much as we can too at various opportunities where people invite us to just talk about some of the barriers to individuals getting the help that they need. My brother was kept from getting his Vivitrol because he wasn't in the specific therapy that the clinic mandated. Um, we talk about that. We, we I, within Zynga, um, did a lot of work in an article early on in the pandemic around the need to make sure that people who have medically assisted treatment are able to access that despite lockdowns and shutdowns that we, we, we can't have a bunch of people who are rec- need to be taking Suboxone or Methadone who can't get to it simply because there's a pandemic happening. Um, so, you know, anytime we have the opportunity to share our perspectives in big and small ways, we, we do that. Um, and it's, you know, it's going to take a lot of systems changes, uh, but also human understanding for us to reduce the opioid epidemic in a dramatic way. Yeah, you guys are doing massive things to chip away at the stigma that surrounds this. I think just educating people and the more we learn, the more we grow as a society, right? Um, aside from season two, what is next for me, for, for you guys? Ooh, uh, well, season two, I mean, it's hard to say I can't wait, but I can't wait. <laughs> October 21st, <laughs> is that the date season two drops? Season two. Yes, okay. ma'am. Oh, how exciting. Yeah. The shorter season. So I think about 12 episodes, Stephanie and the team are knee deep in production, pre-production. Um, we're very excited. Um, I think the idea that you could zoom in on an epidemic to help people understand it has, has uh, spread at Lemonada. So Julian Castro's show originated out of an idea, a text chain idea um, about the poverty epidemic and wanting to find the right person to host that show. Um, so how do we understand poverty? Well, we understand it by understanding humans and the human condition and the, and the people who are actually trying to, to fix it. Um, so, you know, we've, we have that kernel of last day in a lot of the DNA of other shows as well. Um, and I think you'll see more of that from us. Like, how did we get here? How can we fix it? Steph, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, that's, I would agree. I, it's very, um, we are at this point now where um, people who we respect and admire are coming to us and saying, we listen to your ex show and we want to do a show like that, you know, and that's like extremely <laughs> flattering. And uh, it just says like, like, okay, like what we're doing is working. It's making an impact. Um, we're not like screaming into an echo chamber. Um, and so we have a lot of things that are in development right now, too many things, which is a great problem to have. Uh, trying to figure out how we're going to get it all made. I mean, Jess and I, like, she, like, we want to make everything. We want, it's hard. Right now, I think the problem that, that I'm having, and I'm sure you can, you would agree, Jess, is like, we're getting some incredible pitches about things that will make the world better, and we want to do them all. Um, so figuring out how to allocate resources for that, of course, um, we're growing very rapidly. Um, Jess is an incredible truly the best CEO in terms of like, like the value system, you know, guides what we do. So it's like, this is what we believe in. This is what we need. And I'm going to make it happen for you guys, you know, like, so that's amazing. Um, we have a really fun show coming up that I'm so excited about called add to cart, um, that we are just starting to do now. Uh, it is with Kulat Blyasak and Suchin Pak. Um, if you were a person watching MTV in the late 90s and early aughts, uh, you know, oh, Su Chen. That's awesome. Um, and Kulap, yes, <laughs> and Kulap is one of the funniest, funniest, most amazing people I know. Personally, she was, it's very, like, meaningful to me. She was one of Harris's best friends in the world. Uh, and the fact that we get to make this podcast is going to be amazing. It's about the things, both big and little, that we consume. Um, everything from, like, trends to products, to big ideas that guide our lives. Um, so we are thrilled that that's gonna be coming out November 17th. Um, so we are deeply 
and then we've done that. We just debuted our first season two of, uh, of a show, of a series, and that's Good Kids. We debuted today with Rachel Bloom um, from Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, and she's talking about how she delivered her baby, um, first born during COVID, and then a week later, her best friend, writing partner, died of COVID. Uh, and it is truly like life cycle, birth, death cycle. Um, and she's a comedian, so she tells it in a very funny, entertaining way. Um, but it couldn't feel more timely. So we're really excited about that. I love that. Do you ladies have any words of advice for um, our broader community of people who are impacted by addiction? Um, Where do you begin, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess on the, on the topic of just like creative stuff, since that's what we do, it's like, like you have to go through a catharsis, whether you're dealing with an active addiction yourself or someone in your sphere, um, or you've lost someone or multiple people, um, to use disorders, it, it, you just have to get it out there. Um, there's like no way out, but through it or whatever the saying is. And, um, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever that is for you, whether it's like a, a friend you can talk to or therapy or writing, you don't have to be good at it. Um, um, but there's gotta be some processing point. Otherwise it's just festering inside. And, um, I just strongly recommend just giving yourself the grace of being able to talk about your experience and your person. That. Yeah, I, I love, I, I, I read my talked about this um, in season one, but the going on a bear hunt book is, we're going on a bear hunt, we're going to catch a big one. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. You have to go through it. And it's so relevant. And whether that means, like Jess said, creating a podcast or writing a book or going to a therapist or finding a support group. Um, taking care of that going through it process is really important. Um, one of our guests came on and talked about how when your person is going through treatment or is dealing with some sort of an addiction that you have got to take care of yourself. You have got to go to therapy and that your happiness cannot be contingent on whether or not they're going to get treatment. Right. And, and that's also like very groundbreaking because I think that we talk about like being on the roller coaster a lot on last day. Um, and once you get on that roller coaster, like it is, it is rough and it is fast and it, and you feel nauseous and it's going up and down and, and it's really hard to take care of yourself if you're living on a roller coaster. Um, so I'd say like, try to get off the roller coaster, go get some help for your own stuff that's happening. Um, and like understand that idea that addiction is a disease and that like, David Chef said this really aptly very early on in the season that we, we don't get mad at people for exhibiting symptoms of any other disease, yet when it's addiction and they're stealing from us and they're lying from us and whatever it is, that's the disease. That's the brain that's saying, I need to feed my disease. Um, Sam Snodgrass, who was also on our show, said this really well. So, um, you know, listen to last day, obviously. And uh, no, but I do think you'll, you'll learn stuff. And um, I don't know, give yourself that grace and compassion because it is rough. Yes. Definitely listen to Last Day. I am I have no ties to it, but I've been watching it myself and, or watching, listening to it myself. And it is, it's definitely fantastic. Ladies, thank you both so much for taking time out of your busy lives to chat with us today. Um, we at Chatterproof stand behind and are very proud of the work you guys are doing in the addiction space. Um, season two of Last Day debut, debuts on October 21st, so tune in for more information about Last Day. Head on over to lemonadamedia.com or click on the link below. Um, also, we should note that if you have lost a loved one to addiction, please visit www.shatterproof.org to see the National Addiction Memorial, where you can honor your loved one lost to the disease. Ladies, we can't thank you enough. Please continue the important work that you're doing and thank you so much for being here. Thanks for thank having you. us. Thank you so much.